talking, there hasn't been much time for a break, but I'm going to have to carry on with this banquet that we're eating and devouring and enjoying, I hope. Um, what I'd like to do is to start now this session um, talking with Amanda from Venture Arts. And um, Venture Arts is a Manchester-based visual aid studio that runs programs of work with a learning disability focus. It was established for over 30 years. And it has been training, the organization has been training disabled artists in a range of visual art practice as well as developing well, well, much needed opportunities. Um, we talked a lot about performance this morning and it's fantastic that we actually now have some time with Amanda about the visual arts. And please also be aware that we've had Leslie at the back. He has been documenting since 11 o'clock the, the conference. So please do have a look at this kind of fantastic artworks that Leslie is in the process of creating and he'll have a little interaction with Amanda again also in a few minutes. So please everybody, Amanda from Venture Arts. Hello. Oh, it works. You can sit if you want. I could sit. Uh, oh, I can't, can't decide now. Obviously from a visual arts organisation, I'm I'm very humbled amongst all the performers that we've had already this, after, uh, this morning. So yes, Venture Arts, we're based in Manchester. We're a visual arts studio working predominantly with learning disabled artists, but a lot of other artists as well. Um, let me see if I can work this thing. So our vision is a world in which learning disabled visual artists are fully valued and recognized as important contributors to our visual culture. Contributors, firstly, as artists, but also as workers, as critics, as audiences, as participants, and as educators as well. So that's our main mission as an organization. But the reason I'm here, actually, is to talk about the, the, the Shakespearean uh, theme of this afternoon, which I think is do a great thing, do a little wrong. Um, and I keep thinking to myself, do lots of great wrong things and do a little right. I keep getting it wrong anyway. So, uh, so I'll try and do a wrong thing to get a great thing. Oh, done, it wrong. done it wrong again. Anyway. Um, but what, it, what, what, it, what that speaks to me about is um, the value and importance of taking risks and experimenting within the arts. And um, we just so happen to have a project that we've just, we're just finishing, actually, that uh, does exactly that, that's taken huge risks. And uh, experimentation and collaboration have been very much at the heart of it. And it's called outsider exchanges. Um, so essentially we wanted to examine the idea of collaborative practice within the visual arts sector with a particular focus on learning disability arts and its place within the wider contemporary visual arts sector. <clears throat> um, and also we wanted to find really interesting and relevant ways for learning disabled artists to show their work so we started the project about 18 months ago. It was a really simple premise. We uh, decided that it would be really good to get six talented learning disabled artists working as equals with six emerging contemporary artists in one studio over six months. Lots of sixes. Um, and to work with parity, to collaborate, to exchange ideas. Um, and we, want, we called the project uh, Outsider Exchanges because we also wanted to kind of mess around a bit with the idea of um, that whole outsider terminology. Is it really right that learning disabled people and artists should be called outsider artists? Especially considering how they've been marginalised routinely in society forever and ever. So... We, we called it Outsider Exchanges because on this occasion our learning disabled artists from Venture Arts were entirely responsible for inviting 
outsider emerging artists in to work with them. So in fact, the outsider artists on this occasion were not the disabled artists. Um, so that's the outsider exchanges. Um, so yeah, we really through this way of working, we wanted to break down barriers, enable learning disabled visual artists to take a seat within the wider visual contemporary art scene, and enable emerging artists to further their artistic practice through collabor collaborating equally with learning disabled artists. And that's come through really strongly in the project, is how uh, emerging artists have really changed their own practice through working with learning disabled artists. So there are three key elements to it. Oh, hang on, I missed a slide. We worked in partnership with Castlefield Gallery and Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts as well. So yeah, three, three key themes. There's experimentation. We felt that artists needed time and space to get to know each other and feel free to experiment. Um, so often within a sort of arts project that you have to write an application for or whatever, you have to have a kind of end idea of what, what's going to come out of it. But this was really, really important to the experimentation and trying new things and people finding how to work together equally was uh, really important within the project. And second, also collaboration was at the heart of the project. We worked with Tanya, Tanya Ravwebber, I think probably many people in the disability arts world will know Tanya. She's actually in London uh, unveiling her portraits untold, untold paintings today at the National Portrait Gallery. But she helped very much in, in helping the collaboration happen between learning disabled artists and emerging artists throughout the project. And then also importantly was process. Um, often again within our world, um, we're, we're expected to kind of maybe sort of have very, very prescribed ideas around um, how art should happen. And quite often it follows a very guided process. Um, however, in this project, we discarded, discarded any idea of, of that sort of guided process, and it was very much, and there was no mentor mentee situation. Um, and we thought it much better to let artists work together and experiment together and build a body of work together um, that was all about the process and the results of which have been quite, un quite remarkable. So I'm just going to very quickly show you who the artists were in the project. Um, they're images of artists, but I'll just run through their names and we, I, I realize we're on a, on a time limit as well because we're a bit late. So, Leslie Thompson. Leslie is here. Can I introduce Leslie? <laughs> who I have to say is very much one of our extremely most talented artists. And, it, I, yeah, fantastic. And his drawing, probably most of you will be somewhere in that picture. I know I've seen a couple of images of me already. And Sarah Lee on the left, Sophie Lee on the right, Matt Gerling, Tanya R. Weber, Juliet Davis, David James. So I'm whizzing through these. I was going to describe a bit about them, but I know we're short of time. Roseanne Robertson, Horace Lindsay. Oh, we're there. <laughs> I've lost my notes. So um, when, we, when we thought about the sort of artists that we wanted to bring in to work with us, our outsider artists, we were really careful about how we brought those artists in. We were really clear that we didn't necessarily want to be working with artists who had long experience of working within the sort of learning disability field, but we wanted it to be more spontaneous. And we thought the people who'd been in the field for years would maybe come with preconceptions. So, uh, and we wanted to ensure that there wasn't any of that mentor-mentee idea within it. So. Yeah, those we worked with, we, we, we selected, well, mainly actually sort of the learning disabled artists we worked with, selected those people. Um, 
were amazed at, at the talents that they came across when they joined our artists, in fact. Um, and yes, as, as, um, as Roseanne said, as we saw a, a bit ago, she was really, really mindful that when she came in to work in the studio with our artists, she thought it was really important that um, she had to be really careful how she worked with, with our artists because they were all already really damn good as she said, and she didn't want to change any of that or change who they were as artists. <laughs> so yes, so the co collaboration was really true and authentic and entirely reciprocal. And what really came through from the start was a need for all artists to find commonalities of ideas, expression and aesthetic, and extraordinary things came through as a result. So yeah, we launched the show in September at the Manchester Contemporary, which is the bigger, biggest um, art show outside of London. As an organization, we've never presented our work in an arena like this. It was incredible. Um, it held its place amongst all the other galleries and work there, and many people said it was the highlight of their show. And it was really great for us to see this work play a proper role in the contemporary visual arts scene. And for the work, it was for the work in, it, in, in its own right um, and not with a focus on who made it. And in fact, Leslie had uh, three pieces uh, in the show which um, have all been sold uh, by collectors and he has more on order. So it was really fantastic to be... Yeah, well done, Leslie, again. <clears throat> So we got lots of good press from the Manchester Contemporary. I'm probably going to have a whiz, whiz through this. We then moved the show to the Baltic, where it was there throughout October. And again, it continued to receive amazing um, audiences and amazing, amazing feedback. In fact, we got some great feedback from uh, Joe there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from the Baltic show. And then we uh, moved it on to the Whitworth just for a one night, um, um, a one night show. Um, and what happened is throughout the process, one of the commonalities that all the artists found between them was that the fact that everybody enjoyed a party. And so we, we had this amazing, quite outrageous, quite freaky show, art party in the middle of, oh, here we are. We, in the middle of the Whitworth, again, in the middle of the Whitworth, with people wearing party hats, with karaoke, with pineapple and cheese on sticks. Um, it was just, it was kind of, this is where I'm going to come on to this sort of do a little wrong, is that there were so many things that I thought really shouldn't have worked like everybody having a knees up in the middle of the, one of the most prestigious galleries in, in the north of England. Um, and it really did. And there we are, sort of dan dancing at the Whitworth. So yes, do a little wrong. It, equally, what happened as a sort of result of this project is there was a sort of experimental noise band called Psychedelic Brain Cells. Again, that shouldn't be right. But actually, it went down a complete storm. It, they performed at the Baltic, and they performed at the Whitworth, um, and they're hoping to perform again. I have to say, sound-wise, I'm not so sure, but it was brilliant. And there they are again. And yes, again, the art party, the idea that you should have a party with twiglets and cheese and pineapple on sticks and dancing. It, just, it was something that worked well for all the artists and the collaboration really came through. And what, I, th I think what, what people in the art world loved about it was its authenticity. Um, <clears throat> and so that was just a sort of, I'm, I'm just going to do a really quick glimpse of the work because I need to finish three minutes, great. Um, yeah, and again, Rudolf Walker, um, if you could invite anybody to your party, who would you invite? We had life-size cutouts of Rudolf Walker, who is Horace Lindsay, one of our artists, big heroes. And he went around the Manchester Contemporary 
um, standing with people. In, and again, sort of people really enjoyed it and the art world loved it. And this is some of the artwork. This is um, an architectural dress made by Sarah Lee. She's really interested in architecture. So she wanted to make this 3D dress, which has beautiful designs of architecture around on the, on the leaves as well. So it's a beautiful standalone piece. Collaboration paint, in paint, Tanya Arbweber and David James collaborated here to do this picture of David James, David James and his, his illustrations there as well. Intergalactic building, building site was actually a study of chaos, really. So again, David James and Matt Gerling, two artists, just worked together very well because they had a, an amazing sense of the absurd and built amazing sculptures together that never seemed to have a finish or beginning. And that's a representation of their conversations by Matt as well. Uh, Barry Finan is an incredible artist. He draws in text, um, and the way, he, the, the way his texts work also has an interesting sonality about it. And he worked with Roseanne Robertson, who is a sound artist, and they made a sort of reciprocal conversational piece, which I'll show you in a minute. And he writes, small and large, his Leslie again with his Starsky picture, with his Starsky car, which has been sold, hasn't it, Leslie? And Horace Lindsay, Horace Lindsay, Juliet Davis and Sophie and Sarah Lee uh, all worked together on a school memories project which was ended up in a very beautiful film with Horace narrating the film about his school days and also asking audience members to come up and talk about their school days and build schools themselves as well through with Kapler blocks. So that's all part of that school days project up to sort of the size of a wall in, a, in the schools and things like that. So it worked really well for everybody. And this is the, the conversational piece between the artists, uh, Roseanne Robertson and Barry Finan, who presented their ambitions, dreams, but also their vulnerabilities through this piece, which was really touching, I think. And there's the fire at Withenshaw Hall. So this is about Withenshaw Hall, which is our local, a local hall to Sarah. Um, and she did representations of the hall before and after the fire it had, which ruined half of it. Another of Leslie's pieces, Tatanka. And finally, this is uh, Tanya Robb's representation of the art party, uh, an iPad drawing, which I think really shows the life and the vitality in the whole project. So yeah, it, it really, I think, it, it, it um, epitomizes this sort of Arts Council's creative case for diversity. I know we've just been talking about diversity and that maybe being a difficult word. Um, because actually here a range of artists work together, they learn from each other, they all develop their practice together and they collectively enrich the visual arts culture and aesthetic. Um, and this, with this, they've furthered conversations around learning disability arts aesthetic and its absolute relevance in the arts. So I think I'll stop there and maybe take some questions with Leslie. Leslie, do you want to come up here? So just before we go, um, yeah, sorry. So just before, this is Leslie Thompson, uh, one of the artists on the Outsider Exchanges project. Do any time, sort of after the event or whatever, have a look. Leslie's going to be back tomorrow and going to carry on drawing day two as well. I, I think if you're up for it, are you, Leslie? But Leslie, maybe we could just have a quick come come by the microphone. Have a maybe come and have a look. Just don't say hello to. Hello to people. Hi, hi, hi. hello, everybody. Hi. My name is Leslie Les Thomas. I'm the good drawer. Yeah, 
I drew a picture of a star skin hut in, um, in, in, in the summer I was working in Charlton's workplace ever since. So, so yes, in the summer, tell, tell yeah. us about how, what it was like working with all the um, artists in the studio in Charlton. Well, I, I drew a picture of um, the valley of, of the Guanji, the dinosaur. And, and uh, a few pictures of the cartoon of Tarzan. Ron Eli. And his chimp. Sing through the trees in, in colorful during the summer. And when you worked with yeah. um, when you worked with other artists in the studio. Yeah. Who did you work with? You worked quite a lot with Matt, yeah. didn't you? What did you and Matt work together on? We worked together on the, uh, the cartoons and that. Yep. Yeah. If I can remember. And in fact, Matt has, t yeah. has said that as a result of working with Leslie, his whole practice has changed because he'd forgotten about drawing. And he'd forgotten about drawing um, just because he had a need to draw and because he wanted to carry on drawing. And that it's actually working with Leslie on the project has completely changed his practice going forward. So, yeah, well done, Leslie. Um, I'm trying to think. So, is there anything else that you'd like to say about um, working on the Outsider Exchanges project? Perhaps you'd like to tell people what it feels like to have sold um, quite a significant amount of work. Uh, do, do you have a picture of uh, one of the, or, or the rest of that, that are due, due to the British Bulldog and some of or was that, that died in the 1980s. It, it's, a, it's a picture of Big Daddy and uh, John Haystacks at the time tribute. It was our youngest to watch in the, in the 80s. Right, you and Juliet made a, a life-sized yeah. life -size British Bulldog, didn't you? In fact, the Baltic were not too keen on leaving the British Bulldog on their wall throughout October, I have to say, for obvious reasons. But, um, yeah, the British Bulldog yeah. featured prominently, um, as he does in your work, yeah. in lots of your work, in fact, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so what do you think uh, you have taken from working with other artists in that way, or from working in the studio? How, do you think you've... How does your how do you feel about your art now? Well, my drawings are a great fun for me for me to do on my my imagination. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Leslie has the most amazing imagination and can just slip right back to. Wait, what sort of period of time are you? Is this time that you 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 draw from imagination and from memory? What what kind of period particularly? Well, do, do you picture of her? Uh, is it? Do you picture of the Native American Indian Tatanka? One of the wrestlers, the, the feathers. Yeah, that's yeah. that sold as well, didn't it? Sold, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sold. Mm. <laughs> In fact, Jane was saying earlier that uh, that uh, Leslie is kind of dressed like a businessman today and, and is fast becoming one with his art sales. <laughs> mm. But so I think that's probably it from us for now. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And that much welcomed change from talking about performing arts and actually 
experiencing some fantastic visual artwork there. And thank you so much, Amanda and, and Leslie. And what I would like to do now is to invite Colin and Trish from Disability Arts Online to come up and give us um, a little bit of a, a review of the day, their experience. So if you'd please welcome them. Thank you. Thanks. Um, stand, yeah. certainly been a really full day and um your mic's not on yet ah is I'll that speak better first <laughs> um can i just do a little bit bit of introduction about disability arts online if you don't know us we've been going since 2002 and we launched our new website this year it's got a new url it's disabilityarts.online um, we're really excited about the new website, so do take a look. And we are launching a sister website very soon called Viewfinder, which will be viewfinder.online. Well, um, Kate started the day by um, reminding us about disability arts as the last avant-garde, um, um, a phrase coined by Inka Shonabari. And we went through a whole range of reasons why we are the last avant-garde. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, it's been something that's, uh, that people have picked up on since then a lot and, and used it, and I think it's still really relevant today. Um, going into the um, different uh, presentations, uh, we... We were looking in, uh, sorry, Kate, Kate started off with some really interesting questions. Um, so things like, do we need to be educated in, his, in, in our history and each other's politics? Um, is the, is the politicized, politicized perspective of disability no longer important? And I think those are really interesting questions that are going to go forward from today a lot more. Um, so first speaker, Heidi, it was just, it was so wonderful to hear from Heidi. I don't know Call the Midwife at all, and um, so it was really interesting to hear how, um, particularly that uh, Heidi recognised her, uh, her starting point for an interest in, in disability from a personal experience um, with her brother, and um, the way in which various different storylines have been fed through into such a mainstream programme. And um, we, we, there was a lot of talk about m mainstream versus disability arts and the, the parallels be, 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 between, between them. And um, one, one of Kate's questions was, is the political perspective of, of disability no longer important? And um, we inter interrogated the kind of that dichotomy between mainstream and disability arts to kind of illustrate that question. Um, and we talked about the dramatic changes in the political climate, particularly over the last year, and how that's influencing the way that we're talking. Um, something that really struck me was um, John McGrath when he was talking about um, the, the impact that disability arts has on the mainstream. And uh, I was just like, yes, finally, there's a, there's a person from a mainstream organization really recognizing the uh, aesthetic impact, uh, the, the impact on an artistic level that disabled artists can make on the mainstream and are making and have made. Um, so I was really encouraged and excited by that and I want to hear more of it. And it really was the creative case in action for me. Um, so, I want to commission him to write things. <laughs> there, were, there was um, a lot of very passionate talk about the lack of younger disabled people uh, in, the mo in the sector generally, and um, <coughs> ways of bringing younger disabled people on, on board. And, and, and John McGrath made a really important point about it's not about 
us, the older people within the, the movement, educating younger people. It's about us listening and learning from younger people. Yeah, and also that it's certainly about um, not waiting for people to come through the mainstream routes to you, but um, to go out and talent spot in um, more unusual places where, where, where you can find talent um, that hasn't been able to access mainstream education and training routes. There was some really interesting um, kind of looking back over the history of disability arts and and uh, Jenny Seeley in particular talking about some of the, the history of, of Grey Eye and uh, Interplay before Grey Eye and um, how uh, you and Marshall going out on the s streets to, f to find blind people and going up to blind people on the streets randomly and saying, would you like to be an actor? Um, because he was so passionate about the fact that uh, Hounds by Maria Oshodi had to star blind actors. And also, um, whilst we're celebrating the fact that we are getting into mainstream places and um, there are some fantastic programmes out there like Ramps on the Moon, um, Jenny warned us of the danger when the mainstream get wind of your brilliance and uh, that they take it and use it and then they get the applause for it and we don't get recognised for our contribution. And, um, yeah, that kind of poaching of talent and then the the sort of dumbing down of the disability voice the the the, the watering of the disability voice um and he heidi and john and and jenny talked a lot about um the the gatekeepers educating the marketing departments to think about disabled auto audiences and to um encourage disabled writers to to pitch to uh, gateway TV shows like Holby and Don't Call the Midwife and t to um, ensure that the disabled voice is, uh, is still alive. Should we move on to the um, individual sessions? Because mm -hmm. I'm aware that uh, um, people won't have heard what's happened in the sessions that they weren't in. So the, the round table discussions. Um, I attended the first one, to crip or not to crip, and um, so just a couple of little points from that. The idea of role models um, was, was noticed as, as being quite an important thing, um, and a particular example of, um, there's a film on, uh, that, that people have uh, shared on Facebook and stuff of a, a young girl receiving a doll that um, has leg prosthetics that's the same as her and the 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 moment of recognition that, that it's oh it's someone like me um and also about disability being a part of identity but not a whole identity um that 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 was seen as really important as well then then in 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 terms of the sort of specifically about cripping up the 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 main points um certainly when I was in the room, was about um, that acting is actually, it's, it's about being somebody else. Um, but if the disabled people do get parts, do we then have to go down to being impairment specific? Does it have to, to, to go down to, to that level? And the main thing is, it's not always disabled people for um, roles where there is a storyline about disability. Why can't disabled actors play other roles where it just happens to be a part of their physicality? Um, I, I went to the, the Comedy of Disabled Errors roundtable discussion with um, Lost Vo Voice Guy Lee, uh, Lawrence Clark and Sam Avery, um, three disabled um, stand-up comedians, uh, two disabled stand-up comedians and one non-disabled. Um, uh, we talked a bit about abnormally funny people, uh, which uh, Lee and Lawrence are a part of, uh, and the, um, the ribald sort of uh, sending up of the token non-disabled com comedian and the rights and wrongs of um, comedy. And, and of course, comedy is 
by its nature spontaneous and so the kind of um, the policing of comedy is can be quite thorny um, um, and it's we talked about how at its essence comedy is about um, our, our shared humanity and about sh about sharing our humanity um, and uh, the joke it's always it's all about context it's all about um, the, the the point that uh, um, that that you want to make um, and um, it's not about censorship it's about being aware and um, yeah, it depends on how the how the joke is written and the way it's presented, um, and the and the the process, and um, yeah, I uh, I'm running out of energy fast here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to sum up, um, I also attended her. The wheel has come full circle. Question mark, which was um, an interesting one because this conference was designed. Um, part, uh, a large part of it was designed before all the po political activity um, over the last few months. So it kind of feels like um, looking towards the future is quite uncertain. There's some real threats, but there's also some positive things. And I think the main word that came out of it was that there must be much more collaboration in the future. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much for, for that. Again, it's so difficult to do this. It's like we said about Tammy Reynolds with her poem in Before Lunch, to actually participate, to engage, to be present, and still at the same time try and have that distance to be able to reflect and present ideas on a kind of incredibly rich um, banquet to carry on. I'm hungry, clearly. I still want to talk about food. But um, thank you so much for that. What I would like to move on now is to invite back again our chair um, of, of, of DADA to ask Jane, if she would, Jane Cordell, if she would come to the front because she will be in interview with the wonderful Tony Heaton. And um, I think we're just going to organize that now. So if, Jane, if you would come, and also Tony's approaching, that would be brilliant. Thank you. not like the floor? Anybody definitely hostile to the floor? Nobody? Okay, carry on. So it's a beautiful floor. As I was talking about it, to admire it. Yeah. Tony. Hello. It's, it's a great privilege to be asked to interview you. I have to start with a confession. I'm actually a bureaucrat, not an artist, I'm sorry. <laughs> So if you want to walk away now, feel free. No, no, I'll stick it out. You might not feel it's a privilege at the end. Wonderful. Fiddling with me, Mike. Come on, Jane, give me the questions. <laughs> One of your online profiles describes you as a father, a father. artist, uh, yeah. sculptor. Yep. Fiddler of butts. I'm not sure about that one. Well, Fiddler of butts. I like a bit of ambiguity. A little bit of ambiguity. Though. Yeah. Fiddler. Fiddler no. of butts. Fiddle, no, fiddle, fiddle around. But the end of that description 
It says you like animals, but not perhaps you like people, but from a distance. So would you like me to go further away before we start? No, it's fine. This, this is comfortable. I like to always consider access issues. Okay, but seriously, on to your questions. I'm sure there's many things we'd like to know about you. You bring such rich experience. I think we need to allow about 12 hours rather than half an hour, but we'll do our best. They're all ready for a beer out there. Come on, get on with it. Let's get a beer down. It's Okay, in an interview last year at the Awkward Busters Lux, that's a quote, that's not about being right. Yeah. Um, you said that someone had described artists as like wheat, mm. that the harder you cut them down, the more vigorously they grow. So first question, if artists are like weeds, what are disabled artists like? Well, they're even more tenacious weeds. They're the sort of hogweed of weeds. I'm not, I'm not a horticulturalist, so I can't give you a... Latin description, but yeah, the most tenacious no, weeds. Can I? Yeah, we must have gone to the same school. It was approved, as the old joke said. So I just a hogweed. Anybody here feel like hogweed? Hogweed, yeah. It's a particularly malevolent weed. But yeah, I did say that artists are like weeds. They're the harder you cut them down, the faster they grow, the more vigorous. Yeah. Well, we are tenacious, aren't we? Because we're still here. You know, we're still here. I mean, after however many years we've been here. And we're still here, even though we've had fuck all funding to support our work. And we've had very little exposure in the media of the work that we do. Um, so the fact that we're still here does make the analogy particularly apt, I think. You may not agree. Do you think that malevolence is therefore in a strange way something that's important for us as artists? Well, I think, I think um, many artists are kind of subversive. I think, I think, um, I think there's almost a... I think you've got to sign up to be a bit subversive to want to be an artist in the first place. Um, so, yes. I I'm not being defensive with my arms folded. I just kind of holding myself up a bit. I'll, I'll not do it. Oh, did you hear my shoulder crack then? That's how old I'm getting. You might be able to hear the crack in the microphone yeah. when you get to a certain age. Yeah. But continuing the sort of gardening metaphor, oh, no. you use another beautiful phrase. <laughs> I don't know if you're a gardener. You talk about disability arts having fell like a tree in a forest, unheard. Oh, those lo lovely words. I love that image. Mm. Okay, two questions, really. Has disability arts fallen? And the second question, if it has, what should we be doing to either bring it up again or maybe plant some new trees? Well, I'm impressed you've done your research. I've even forgotten that I ever said that. I'm a bureaucrat. Oh, well, yeah, good. God, what else is she going to dig up on me? That's what I'm really worried about now. <laughs> yeah, slightly paranoid here. Um, yeah, I said to him that disability arts is a bit like a tree that fell over in a forest that nobody heard. Yeah. What did I mean by that? <laughs> well, it's a bit like that great tree that crashes down in the forest and nobody's there, so nobody actually hears it. So philosophically, did it make a noise or did it not make a noise? Did it, you know, was it, was it an event of momentous proportions or did it not really happen? So I think there's something about disability arts that is amazing and crashing and wonderful and majestic. And yet there is a sense that for many, many people it never even happened. Or there is a memory that something may have happened. Or a remnant. Thank you. Mm. That would lead me to ask you, please, to think, could you think for a moment about what you feel were the most important moments so far in your career, maybe your finest moments, perhaps one or two? Finest, my finest moment is yet to come, I feel. I'm, I'm awaiting my finest moment. 
with um, an eagerness you know, and a sort of sense of anticipation that's barely contained. <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've really enjoyed, um, yeah, I think we've had some good gigs over the years. The thing is, we've had some great gigs and there's just been a small party. You know, there's only been a few of us at the gig, but, it, you know, it didn't make it any less memorable somehow. I'm a bit against this mainstream idea. Every other word's been mainstream today. What's wrong with you all? What the fuck's the mainstream? Who cares about the mainstream? What is it? What is the mainstream? You know, it's, it's the people who are 20 years behind the exciting stuff, isn't it? People are just about catching up. People who are, you know... Sorry, did I interrupt the applause then? Um, I apologise. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I wrote something... You may, you may have a question about this, because I wrote about it some time ago. But I said I'm not interested in what's in the mainstream, because it's kind of... You know, not a lot, f you know, things flow in the mainstream, but I'm interested in the rock pools and the stuff that gets washed up on the shore, the sort of, the romantic things that you find and think, what the hell was this? What did this used to be? Uh, romantic rock pools. Does that yeah. got to do anything with, to do with your fiddling or not? Well, not quite. No, I sort of fiddle about in the rock, the rock pools, cesspits and rock pools of the world, yeah. I think the interesting stuff is outside of the mainstream, actually. So there's one thing I'm taking away from today is probably stop using that word. Mainstream. Actually. Well, I'm I don't know why. Explain to me what it means, anybody. I don't know. It doesn't mean anything to me, mainstream. If it's what everybody wants, then I really don't want it. You know, I don't shop in supermarkets. I don't have a television. I, I don't know. You know, I don't really travel much on motorways. I don't swim down the middle of the channel. I urge everybody else to join me. But then we'd all be in the mainstream, wouldn't we? <laughs> oh, damn it. It's a bit like Jenny saying, you know, we, 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 our uniqueness gets dissipated once it gets hijacked by um, whoever it is in the mainstream. So if we took the people in this room, mm. I'd be as a sculptor. Mm. And you made us mainstream into a sculpture. Yeah. What would it look like, perhaps? It, I think it'd just be a bit of a blobby thing, really. A, blob, <laughs> a bit of a blobby thing. <laughs> I don't know what it would be. You must remember, when I make sculpture, I have to think about it for about five years <laughs> before I ever do anything. You know, I've made three sculptures in my entire life, and I'm 128 years old. <laughs> now, so I'm, you know, the longer gestation period than an elephant or a humpback whale or something. Um, so maybe the blurby, blurby one we should I maybe out. take a look at the room and then in about 15 years sort of appear in the middle of the night and stick it against the wall of this building. And you might wander past and say, God, what's that ugly thing? It must be that sculpture that bloke made that he promised to make 15 years ago. <clears throat> <laughs> you like to take your time? I think so, yeah. I wanted to move on to politics, if I may. Anybody who oh doesn't like politics, go to the loo. Well, I tell you what about stuff. There's too much stuff in the world. So anybody that's rushing out there making loads of stuff, stop right now. Take your time, make something, think about it, and decide whether you want to let it loose on the world. And if you don't, break it up, throw it away, you know. It's too much stuff, I think. Don't you agree? Too much stuff? Yeah. <laughs> this year has Politics. possibly thrown up some of them. Sorry, yeah. I beg your pardon. Politics, Politics. yeah, Politics. sorry. This year has seen some mm. of the most alarming reversion to extremism in mm. various areas mm. and uh, an even more alarming increase in hate crime if we're mm. talking about the disabled community. Mm. <laughs> Should disabled art be responding to that? And if so, how, can, mm. how do you think it could best do that? Well, I definitely think it should. I think art should be... I always say art should be dangerous. So, I mean, and disability arts is particularly dangerous. 
Um, so watch out. Um, I th um, the immediate piece of work that sprang to mind was a piece by Simon Raven that was exhibited at the um, Attenborough Art Centre whenever it was, a few months, years, whenever it was. And it's a brilliant film. I think it's called Born Free. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the people who remember things like titles and works. But it's a filmed piece, and it's the end of the Born Free Richard Attenborough film. And, it, and it's scrolling credits, but the credits are the names of all the people who've died as a result of the cuts to benefits and um, not just died after being found fit to work but have committed suicide because they've had their benefits taken away from them. So that's a particularly powerful, subversive and political piece of what I'd call disability arts, which is a specific... You know, disability arts is a specific genre. It's art made by disabled artists and it says something about the wider uh, um, concepts of disability. So uh, I thought, you know, I, I would identify that as being a particularly strong piece of work. If you've not seen it, Simon Raven, um, check it out. I'm sure it's on Disability Arts Online somewhere. And if it's not, it will be before tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> You've got real power, haven't you? No, no, I just like to throw out a challenge now and again. <laughs> <laughs> Is there? Okay. We may have to settle for that then. <laughs> All art's political, really, isn't it? It's interesting, this thought of provocation, what provokes art. Um, for some reason, I've ended up in Poland three times in my life. I don't know yeah. whether it's fight or accident. You know. Somebody trying to tell you something. Do you like sausage? <laughs> I'm okay with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, one of my best friends is Polish. He's, he always says... No, don't blunt on, brother. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. No, totally not. He, my friend always says, we're the offal eaters of the world. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. The first trip I made to Poland was a teenager. I was a musician in an orchestra. And I was under martial law, I remember it being a weird experience. Yeah. But then returning, just after all that finished, things were changing in 1990, and the explosion of art in the intervening period, especially cartoons, very dark, mm. biting, fantastic mm. political art. But that art helped inform what became the Solidarity Movement. Mm. My artist friends, such as I had, mm. they said they felt after the political changes, the art wasn't as good. Yes. So I said, perhaps it's Poland that's been battered to death by the countries. It's in mm. an awkward position geographically. But do you think there's something in that about I, what we need to provoke us? Yeah, I think, I think there absolutely is. I think artists respond to that kind of provocation. Uh, um, and, I mean, it goes back to what we said earlier about artists being weeds. You know, the harder you cut us down, the, the, the faster we grow, the more resilient we grow. I think artists... You know, the best art um, um, results from conflict uh, um, and, you know, the politics of conflict. And I think you can track that through art history for sure. And I think, you know, we, we shape is leading on the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive. And again, I think once we've established that archive, we will be able to look at our own histories. And I know we've talked earlier, and you, you know, in Colin and Trish's summing up, we talked about if we're not in control of our own histories, then somebody else will appropriate it for us. So it's really important that we take control of our own history. And I think when we look at that history, when it's articulated in a way through an archive, we'll see the political responses. And we did talk about the golden age of disability arts, and it was the art that was part of the political struggle for um, disability rights. And I, I do think there was particularly powerful work created up until the, you know, the, the achievement of the so-called disability rights, uh, um, which we know is flawed and toothless, but nevertheless gives us some 
rights. It, it's what I call partial access. Um, and I find that more frustrating in many ways than no access at all. Because no access at all, you can rail against. But partial access always feels like, um, what are you grumbling about? Because we've given you one space on the bus. Um, there are two prams in it, by the way, but, you know, fight it out amongst yourselves, guys. Because I'm driving the bus and I don't talk to anybody. Or, yes, we've given you a space on the train, but if your friend or your partner's on the train, they'll go in a different carriage, and actually we're not sure who owns all this luggage that's in the way. So I sometimes think partial access, or we've given you an accessible toilet, but we've also given everybody else permission to use it. So you'll still be crossing your legs for a considerable amount of time. I can't think of any more partial access analogies, perhaps you may want to help. I don't know. The ramp up to the building, but not within the building. <laughs> the ramp up to the building, but not within the building. Like yeah. I've made a maquette for a ramp for the Royal Society of British Sculptors, and it's a ramp, and it's a handrail, and one side of the ramp rail says fuck, and the other side says off. Um, I'm waiting for it to be commissioned. Two grand should see it right. And then we just quietly wheel it up to the front of the Royal Society of British Sculptors and see what, see what they do with it, really. Mm. Sorry. Uh, I tend to be a raconteur. I'm sorry, but it reminds me of a company of policy guy from the UK in Warsaw. And we took a trip. He wanted to visit the town. He said, we'll show you it. So he said, let's try this special lift that goes under the main road. And we did it. I'd never mm. used it before. And we got down, and there was a lady's underwear shop with red lace and black. Yeah. And he said, I thought it went to the underground, and there were steps from a lady's underwear shop down to the underground, but you couldn't actually get to the other side of the road. Or up. You could go down and look at the underwear and go back up again. And he said, I think that's a work in progress, really, isn't it? Uh, my favourite lift was in a hotel in Italy, and it went... I didn't know this at the time, and I got in it, and I pressed the button, and it went like that, and I felt like I was going to fall over, and it chugged along in a really strange way, and it was hugely disconcerting. And then it banged to a halt, and then it went up a little way, and it actually, when I got out of it and realised what had happened, there was this big slope, and then about ten steps, and the lift didn't take me up the building. It took me up the slope and then up ten steps. So I went sideways, slightly up and slightly sideways. And then it stopped and then I went slightly up. And it was the weirdest experience I've ever had in my life. I, I'll give you the name of the hotel if you want to go and experience it. On Lake Majori. <laughs> Naming and shining like Yeah, <laughs> great hotel. Can I go back sorry, to what you said just before, a few minutes ago? About I can't remember what I said before. Resulting from conflict. Sorry, I remind you, I wrote it down, <laughs> okay. actually, with the handwriting. Oh, yeah. You said arts as a result of conflict. Mm. Do you think there's something in there about the conflict that's inside each of us as individuals, as well as external conflict? So disabled people have greater experience, richer experience of that. Mm. Well, I think we express it. Artists express it through art. Uh, politicians express it through talking a lot and not doing very much. Um, um, inarticulate people sometimes express it by hitting each other. I don't know. Yeah, I think we. I think artists express through work. Hmm. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think we do that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Can I now blatantly exploit the fact I have a world expert opposite me? <laughs> because next week yes. um, I've been given the opportunity to talk to some government people yes. about issues around disability and work. Mm. So it's not strictly in the art sector, yes. but they're trying now to look at this whole notion of being self-employed, mm. mm. why larger numbers of disabled people 
as self-employed, you have previously criticised the access mm. to work scheme for being rigid, for being, as you said, a bolt on, sometimes mm. it would be nice. But do you have any words of wisdom or advice about the, the government that seems to want to learn more? Is it our government or somebody else's government? Has anybody else noticed that Theresa May's initials are the same as Margaret Thatcher's, but the other way around? That occurred to me on the train this morning. I've no idea why. I have got that right, haven't I? TMMT. Yes. Are politicians are other, other politicians? Is it Polish politicians? Oh, Polish politics is great. Is it? Okay. I mean, I, I mean, give us jobs. It's not a difficult thing. You know, there are lots of disabled people who want to work. So, um, I don't understand why... When I speak to somebody in the Access to Work, Department of Work and Pensions, wherever it is, in government departments, you know, that I'm not dealing with disabled people. I, I don't understand why um, there are not more disabled people employed uh, um, throughout all government departments. And maybe they are, I don't know, but I, I suspect they're not. Um, I'm old enough to remember the 3% quota. Does anybody else remember the 3% quota scheme? I mean, we thought it was a bad idea, but actually, on reflection, it might have been a good idea. I mean, like all many laws, if it's not enforced, then it won't achieve its objectives. But if you work out that a certain percentage of people are, of the popula of working age population are disabled people, then whatever that percentage is, then we should be working to try and reflect that within within the uh, within within employment um and i think that's what what was attempted with the three percent quarter scheme but it wasn't enforced you know like the 30 mile an hour speed limit wouldn't be adhered to if it wasn't enforced or wearing a seat belt or not drinking and driving and whatever else it is i think always with uh, disability related issues there is no enforcement of our rights there's no enforcement of the things that we um, need to help us support us, whether it's in life or in work. So um, it's back to the partial access thing where people think they've solved, the, you know, we've solved it for you guys, um, but actually you've not. And when we moan about our par partial access, I think we're seen to be a bit of a, well, stop whinging, we've done our best. That sort of feels like... Um, Feels like where we are on that one. Talking about that, so anything you think we could learn from other marginalised groups who seem to have made more progress than us? Well, I'm not sure they've made much more progress than us, really, when I talk to other marginalised groups. I think the thing we ought to do is get together, because once all the marginalised groups come together as our associated tribes and realise that we've got lots in common and we share lots of uh, oppressions, then uh, we become a majority. Perhaps we become the mainstream, marginalised mainstreamers. I don't know. There'll be more of us than, you know, what Grayson Perry calls default man. You know, the archetypal white, middle-aged, middle-class chap who doesn't belong to a tribe because he doesn't need to. You know, it's like, uh, we, we are given words that we, you know, we are, in, we have labels imposed upon us. They're not our labels. So, um, you know, Thank let's you. try and escape from our labels and let's join together <laughs> and, 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 I don't know, be more political collectively, maybe. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. We've almost used up our time, but I've got one last cheeky question. No, oh, you want to borrow a fiver? <laughs> yeah, thanks for the bus pass. Uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> the prices are atrocious these days. Not for me, I've got a bus pass, love. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a freedom pass, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> because of your immense age, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the last question. If we could give you a superpower for a day... Or well, a superpower. Which power would you choose and how would you use it? Well, I've got a story about this that somebody said in an interview. So you ask me the question again and I'll do the gag. 
and you give any answer you like. Yeah. That's what politicians do. Okay. <laughs> so if you could choose a superpower, one superpower, yep. for one day, yep. which would you choose and what would you do with that? I'd, use, I'd choose China. <laughs> Maybe Russia. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what would I do with it? I'd, um, I'd, I'd invade America, for Christ's sake. <laughs> we got, um, what were those Exocet missiles with the word Trump written on it? I think, you know, I think, I don't know. I'm joking. I, I'm not, I, you know, I would, I'm not interested in violence. I'm also paranoid. The man reaches out, doesn't he? No, anybody that mocks disabled people doesn't deserve our... We shouldn't waste time even discussing him. So, yes, I don't know what my superpower would be. No. I'm sticking with China. I was thinking about the thing. Of provocation. We have a massive source of provocation. Maybe yeah. let's yeah. use it as artists to provoke good art, humour. Yeah. Yes, humour. Oh, well, I mean, art should. I think art should be subversive and have a streak of humour running through it. I think. Yeah, I, I do think so. Some of my work's got humour written in it. It's not easy to find, sure. but it's in there somewhere. Oh. It's quite, hard, it's quite hard to satirise Trump. One final question. Any mm. advice for the younger people in the audience and listening out there? Don't give up. Them? Don't give up. Be tenacious. Ask questions. Ask why all the time. Why didn't I get the job? Why didn't I get the grant? Yes. Oh, no. Tenacity. Be difficult. Tenacity. You know, be no. difficult. We want it to be different. That's right. That's malevolent. We. Yeah, yeah. Get out there. Do it. We're getting too old to kick, kick back. You know. Well, we're not getting that old. No surrender. No surrender. <laughs> Keep. Get out there. You're our new. You're the new blood we need to go out and chain yourself to buses. Partial access. It's not enough. Chain. Chain yourself to buses again. Um, talk to the arts council about getting an. A, an accessible entrance to the main building in London rather than a partial accessible entrance. Fight injustice wherever you see it. Thank you. Tony Hayton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Who's buying the beer? And where do we... Oh, no, not again. It was my round last time. And where do we go for a beer? Well, before the beer, can I invite us all to give heartfelt thanks to Tony because, of course, he's retiring and no, he's leaving not. shape. He's not retiring. Well, he's not retiring, Don't sorry. Use... He's leaving shape. I was given the wrong information. Sorry. But no, no, no. He's just leaving I'm, shape. I'm leaving shape after nine years. Yeah as chief executive, to spend more time making my own work as a sculptor. Good. But I'm actually going to stay on as chair of shape. Oh, so. fabulous. Retiring? Artists never retire. No, it's, I meant more retiring from the organisation. I don't mean from life or art or politics. You meant becoming a more retiring sort of person. I mean spending more time Shame on your retiring. art yeah. and your provocations. We want yes. you. Can you be out there kind of provoking us a bit more? But... I, I want us all just to also give him so many thanks for not just this, but all the work that you've done, everything that you've supported, all the provocations that you've made, and all the change that you have prompted, because I think you really have, Tony, over, over the last year. So can we also thank him? Thank you, Kate. Thank you. And thanks also to, to, to Jane for that. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to do a few concluding words because it's been quite a full day. It's been rich. It's been extraordinary. 
Um, I've got a book full of quotations from, from overheards or things that I've experienced today. Um, I think we had some incredible sound bites just then from, from Tony. Um, and, but I just also um, just want to say a few things. I loved what Tony was saying about the mainstream because I started it off this morning talking about this so-called mainstream. And I love the fact that, you know, what is the mainstream? Isn't it the people who are 20 years behind the interesting stuff? I think we're the interesting stuff. I really do, seriously. And I don't think we should ever forget that. And I think we have to, as Tony was saying, to just keep on, keep on, keep asking questions. Um, you know, Madam Mac, Julie McNamara earlier was talking about we have to keep knocking on those doors. We know that the knuckles get skinned when you've been beaten on that door for 30 odd years, as many of us here have. But we, maybe we just have to keep on doing that. Um, there is so many positive and creative and joyful things. Um, and I just really hope that you enjoyed today and that you, those of you who can come will be here for 10 a.m. In, in the morning for more discussion, more events, more conversation, more interaction. Um, and I mean, the final thing I would like to do is just to thank the people that made this happen, and all the people that have been beavering away, kind of making sure we kept moving today, are wonderful BSLIs. We've got all the other wonderful support that we've had. I don't know if Anne is still here. We had you know, our audio description. We have our technicians. We've had the volunteers. We've had our, our, our I was going to say touch type, <laughs> apologies, but all the, thank you, <laughs> all the people that are there trying to facilitate this and allow us to have these conversations and come together and to communicate. And then I also, of course, want to thank everybody who participated. That's not just the people that were up here before the microphones, but sitting there, it's exhausting, it's important. But you're there engaged and participating. And huge thanks for that. Huge thanks, of course, to, to the building that we're in and the people that helped make this happen. But, of course, biggest thanks to the people of Dada and, and our canon Ruth Gould. And I hope that before we go off into the evening, you might be around for a launch at 5 o'clock, which is the Disabled Country Toolbox which is an education toolkit which was developed with young children. That is happening at five o'clock today downstairs in the atrium. So before we dissipate into the night, huge thanks and I hope you have a good one. So thank you. more we have to thank Kate she's done a brilliant job hasn't she thank you so much Kate <laughs>